Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for coming to lecture four in this uh, still sort of surprising <laughs> phenomenon of having this lecture series. Um, so when I'm picking memes for both these talks and for this eventual book, there's really one of the big problems is there's so much to choose from, right? And it's, it's ephemeral. People forget things from a few years ago. It's hard to assess what's important. It can be easy to assess, though, what, what is um, possibly attractive or, um, or amusing. Um, and today's topic, I think, fits, um, fits that uh, category uh, rather well. In the previous lectures, I've tried to draw attention to memes that people might not know so well. Um, and by the way, I'm, I will take requests for topics for upcoming lectures since, there's, since it really could go in any direction. Um, but one of the things I'm thinking about for the book, um, and which is one of the reasons I ended up with this topic, because I know this is going into the book, um, one of the things I'm thinking about is how Russia is represented and represents itself um, in internet memes and in viral videos. Um, because this is a big part of how the world communicates nowadays. And if, if we spend so much time online, as we are all doing now, but in general, if um, a lot of people spend um, a lot of time um, watch, sharing videos, sharing memes, then um, these representations actually mean something and um, can theoretically at least influence our perceptions of um, entire peoples, entire countries, entire phenomena. Um, so today's talk is about some of the most visible Russian content on the internet. Visible, here I mean visible, not just on the Russian internet, but um, on the internet um, around the entire world. And that is video collected from Russian automobile dash cams, um, dash, dashboard cameras. Um, this stuff is fun. It's easy to show. It's easy to get a laugh, as we'll see. I'm not above all of that at all, um, though I do, I worry, I have a pet peeve about pop culture presentations that sometimes the material can be so bizarre or funny that all you have to do is show it. You don't really have to comment on it or, or analyze it. So I do want to avoid that. But um, this is going to be a particularly challenging one because the material is so, so choice. Um, so before we start looking at some of this uh, video, I want to, um, to highlight the topics that I want to be thinking about as I'm talking about this material and then as, I, as I'm writing it all up. Um, one is the phenomenon of car culture in Russia um, and cars in politics and cars in the Russian internet. Um, and then the big question that I've already alluded to, Russianness for domestic and Russianness for foreign consumption. So first though, um, I want to uh, talk about dash cams in the context of Russia's role on the internet. Because dash cams um, are where we, we start getting the question of Russian content circulating, not just in Russia and outside of Russia. Dash cams really kind of uh, change the game. Things like Obama Chmo get the occasional write-up, but they don't spread virally in English. Um, so here's a huge generalization, but I'll go with it. I probably wouldn't write it down. Um, on the internet, Russians are um, synonymous with two things um, broadly, anger and absurdity. Um, uh, Russia occupies a, uh, a couple of special places on the Anglophone internet, um, largely because of video and because of gaming. Um, Russians produce a lot of video that gets shared on the, on the, um, on the internet. There's a lot of um, capture of Russian conversation and participation um, through uh, video platforms that, uh, that show people playing games like Twitch. Um, so Generation Z gamers who don't know, don't know Russian, they know a lot of Russian swear words. Um, and they have a lot of um, ideas about Russians from stereotypes of, of um, Russian gamers. Russian gamers are not very popular um, among non-Russian gamers on the internet um, for uh, precisely the stereotypes that I've started to allude to. Um, a lot of, the, interestingly enough, that you know, Russian gamers are on all of the different platforms, play all the games that everybody else does and, and, and games of their own. But where um, the phenomenon of Russians, of um, talking about Russian gamers and the Russian gamer vocabulary really comes up um, is on a particular video game, which is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which started in 2012 and is still played. Um, and when I've done searches online for um, uh, uh, Russian gamers and Russian swearing and all that, it almost always goes back to, um, to uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. So um, what I wanna show, this is in preparation for getting to the dash cams. What I wanna show is a couple of videos um, about that, of Russians cursing while playing video games. Um, this will, the, the purpose I think will become clear uh, as we watch it. I'm not gonna show the, the entire videos. Um, one second here. Stuff online about 
um, about uh, Russian gamers and clips of Russian gamers. There's also explain, uh, videos made to explain Russian gamers um, and the language of Russian gamers. And I thought that this would be an interesting way to go into it. So um, here is a rather popular video. I think it's gotten like several hundred thousands of, um, of views. And we're not gonna watch the whole thing, but um, of a guy uh, talking to gamers about Russian gamers. So we'll watch a little bit of it. Let's be honest, when things are going badly in game, we all express our frustrations differently. Your mom is fat! Fat ho! But rage isn't something that's bound by borders and languages. And if you've ever shared a gaming lobby with Russian speaking players, you've probably experienced that firsthand. Why you don't check me the fucking up? Чёртов нубас траханы пидорас, блядь, не стал жрать этого, блядь. Maybe it's the result of decades of political tomfoolery or being expected to wrestle bears at the age of five. Um, so notice already that th this is a motif we're going to see again and again, which is, and it's obvious why why it happens and why it works, um, to generalize from these cases of um, extreme Russian behavior to all of Russia and then bring in every stereotype you have, like the bears. Um, so that was just, so for those of you who don't speak Russian, just trust me, there was a lot of um, very um, intense swearing here. And the other video I wanna share with you is made by, um, I believe an American, um, giving his version of a stereotype of a Russian gamer. And again, it's not that he is so accurate, but the fact that someone bothered to do this, and lots of people, again, I think in the hundreds of thousands, have um, watched this, suggests that he has um, uh, tapped into something. And again, we're not going to watch the whole thing. Oh, 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 bleh, bleh. Oh, da vai, da vai. Time for breakfast, my friend. Oh, bleh. That was good breakfast, but now it's time to play some CSGO. Здравствуйте, team! Oh my god. Вы русский, Крузива? Can you fucking speak English? Я стараюсь говорить по-английски. Please, talk in English. Another fucking Russian on our team. Let's go. B side, let's go B side. Oh my. Jeffy. Really? Alright, fuck this shit. Нет, нет, нет. Fucking Putin. Suka. Bled. Suka. I go on Twitch, bled. Oh. So, um, the upshot here is that. People around the world now know, know suka and bleds, in particular suka bleds, um, thanks, to, uh, thanks to video gamers, to Russian video gamers. Um, they have enriched uh, non-Russians vocabulary um, in a very powerful way, even though um, people get mixed up about what these things actually mean. Um, and then this all rolls in quite easily into a whole set of stereotypes that this guy clearly um, evidences, you know, the vodka, the Putin, all of that. I don't, it's, it's so obvious I don't really need to explain it. Um, so, um, right. So there's a reason that I'm calling the book that I'm working on Meanwhile in Russia, because one of the big sources of um, Russian viral nomadic con of, of viral nomadic content, content about Russia that helps reinforce the stereotypes of Russian um, absurdity and rage um, is uh, the set of meme pages and meme fan groups um, called Meanwhile in Russia. So um, here is a Santa Claus on a tank. Um, here is a Facebook group of Meanwhile in Russia. Um, here is a whole bunch of things on a Pinterest thing for Meanwhile in Russia. Um, what you get when you search Meanwhile in Russia on um, Google. And uh, yes, so um, related to this is a very popular meme of in, in Soviet Russia, which comes from uh, the comedian Yakov Smirnov, who has, who's really just awful, but has really um, did a lot to create stereotypes about uh, Russians in America back in the 1980s. So in Soviet Russia becomes this, uh, this uh, constant uh, frame for memes, even though as we know, 
no Russians in Soviet times would have referred to it um, in the past several decades in Soviet times would have referred to it as Soviet Russia. It's a, it's a big giveaway that this is not a Russian framework would have been the Soviet Union. So for instance, you have right to bear, actually I have to say it with an other, right to bear arms in Soviet Russia, we have right to, bear, to hold bear. Um, and then all of these various in Soviet Russia memes. Um, and um, all of this is going to play into where um, the same stuff that the dash cams um, are a part of because video is really where it's where it's at for creating for creating um, these or perpetuating these stereotypes about Russia um, because the, the video the video niche that Russia occupies is um, was initially occupied almost solely by it because Russia led the way um, when it came to using um, dashboard cameras so why was Russia a pioneer in the widespread use of, dash, of um, dashboard cameras um, there are several reasons um, involving the um, dangers of driving on um, unsafe roads, the, um, the prevalence of um, bribery uh, for um, road, road patrollers who stop you and um, are gonna give you a fine, you have to bribe them, all of these scams, people pretending to be hit by the car. So for self-protection, um, people would put in dash cams. So that means there's countless hours of raw video out there. Um, and from those hours of, of raw video, some Russians, um, began uploading the funny and interesting stuff. So now, this is important to keep in mind when it comes to exoticization and othering. It is people in Russia who are doing the uploading. It's their video. Um, they're the ones who are curating it. They're the ones who are determining what is funny, what is noteworthy, and what is not. Um, so even as, um, as uh, say, Western commentators might use these examples to talk about um, what's typical in Russia, if these things were typical in Russia, they wouldn't be uploaded by Russians. Um, so there is... Um, a, a selection bias here. Um, and also if we're talking about exoticizing Russians, it's the Russians first who are picking up, who are putting up the material that then can be used in the hands of others to exoticize them. There's a huge quantity of video. Um, on uh, Fail Army, which is one of the, um, one of the places to go for um, fail videos. Fail videos are where you watch people like, um, uh, you know, walk into, walk into a wall, try some trick and hurt themselves. Um, all sorts of, the fail videos are loads of fun. Fail Army um, is the go-to place for fail videos. And they have a lot of, not only do they have Russian um, videos, Russian clips as part of their video series, they'll have special themed videos like Ode to Russia um, or uh, Russian camera, Russian car fails because they have so much content and the stuff is so popular that um, they tag it this way. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit of a, of a um, collection of um, Russian dash cam video before we get to a different curated one. But this is the sort of stuff that you can go to find on the internet if you just click on Russian dash cam. Anyway, it goes on like this. You can find this stuff for yourself um, rather easily. Um, I'm, there, I'm reminded as I, as I um, watch this uh, huge quantity of, of Russian video about um, Russian road accidents of the way that you can have a kind of uh, perverse pride in this sort of horrific stuff. There's a, I spent a long time tracking down this quote from a Marinin, uh, Alexander Marinin novel from the 1990s, where in the course of something totally unrelated, they're talking about buying foreign cars and the main character says, well, no, um, I don't drive a foreign car because foreign cars are not equipped to deal with our roads, um, which is this kind of um, strange pride, I think, in our roads are so terrible, only Russian cars can deal with them. It also makes no sense whatsoever, but um, it's the sort of thing I'd hear in conversation now and then as well. 
Um, I used to think that this stuff was so Russia heavy because of the scarcity of, of dash cams elsewhere. And there is more non-Russian car related content out there on the internet, certainly. Um, one of my favorites is the uh, famous can opener bridge in Durham, North Carolina, a bridge that is just a little bit too low for most trucks to um, make clearance, but trucks, but people think it's gonna make clearance, so it just, sh it shears off the top of the truck. There's a website called 11foot8.com with um, a lot of video of these trucks being just destroyed. Um, sadly, they fixed the bridge and now we don't get any new content from it. That's not dash cam, of course, but fail army and other sites do have plenty of non-Russian dash cam footage now, but it just does not stock up to, um, to the Russian content. Um, and so one might ask oneself why, and why is Russian car content so interesting? So um, we need to think a little bit about car culture. Um, the, uh, these car videos, as um, Yelena Nagapov was pointing out in one of our previous com um, conversations um, online last week or two weeks before, they're a great nexus of, cl of, of class encounters. There's a the question, who has the car and who is jumping in front of the car? Who could be hit by the car? Now there's a wide range of cars that you can have. They're the fancy cars that show that you're rich, but um, there is um, some overlap in the idea of you know, having your own car and being something appropriate, uh, something vaguely like what we could call middle class, though it's not a term that I think is really appropriate here. Um, but, it, but it is a, a proper, it is a, a, a um, useful, valuable piece of property that you are showing by using and that you're also putting out in a very vulnerable situation um, because it's circulating around there with all these other cars and all these people who could be hurt by it or could take advantage of it. Um, so um, cars then end up playing a, um, an important role in various um, public disputes and public protests or really um, traffic culture in general. Like in 2016, when truckers were protesting a new um, payment system called Platon that they felt was going to be um, disadvantageous to them. I referred before to protests about um, rich people using um, fla uh, flashing lights to, um, to be able to drive um, unimpeded down the road for no good reason, the um, Moscow Ring Road being so dangerous. Um, so, car, so car political culture was an important um, thing around the turn of the decade, 2010 or so, when you could have um, political protest, protests that were not um, so obviously political. These weren't protests about, say, Putin or the government. They're protests about safety. They're protests about cars. They're protests about taxes and um, and uh, fees. Um, now, truckers um, have long had their own kind of symbolic uh, significance in um, in uh, Russian media. Um, in film, for instance, the truckers are the, often the classic working class hero. You see this in Intergirl. You see this in Brother. Um, there's a sort of trucker type. But personal cars are another matter. They were rare in Soviet times. And now again, we have this, um, this, this huge uh, growth in car ownership, which actually causes a great deal more problems because talk about roads not being equipped for things. Most of the, most of the roads in the big cities were not um, designed with the idea that everybody's going to have cars. So there's um, big traffic problems. Um, so cars are a kind of wealth, a kind of power, but a kind of vulnerability to corruption. And then we get the dash cams. So um, all of this was visible on the um, non-Russian internet for quite a while, but it really um, became um, hyper visible and became the subject of news in 2013 when um, that meteor, uh, the, February 15th, when a meteor hit right outside of Chelyabinsk. Um, many of you might remember this. So this meteor hits right outside of Chelyabinsk um, and there's all this dash cam video of it. And um, John Stewart on The Daily Show did a segment um, that some of you might remember, but it's always worth looking at again. So um, it's just a few minutes. We're going to watch this. In a remote part of Russia, some thought the world was ending when a 10-ton meteor, five stories tall, hurtled to Earth and exploded. Traveling at 33,000 miles per hour, trailing a brilliant white contrail, hitting the atmosphere and exploding with the force of an atomic bomb. Wow. <laughs> On the bright side, it did provide Russians with a fleeting sense of warmth. <laughs> See, this, this, this was scary because it wasn't like a solar eclipse. Yeah. It wasn't like a solar eclipse. No one knew this thing was coming. The question is, how did all these Russians even get this amazing footage? A majority of this footage was recorded purely by chance, captured by small dash-mounted cameras that are now the latest fad among Russian car owners. Let's roll the meteor footage again with the sound up. I'm going to learn the Russian word for holy <laughs> balls. <laughs> The guy in the car 
guy in the car didn't even say anything. <laughs> That's more amazing than the footage itself. The dude in the car is completely unimpressed by a 10 ton death rock <laughs> hurtling in Mach 50 towards the city, which I guess would explain why Armageddon was released in Russia as oil driller gets very good job. <laughs> Is everyone in Russian society just that jaded? Motorists have turned to dash cams for self-protection. Visual proof to fend off charges from possibly corrupt police officers and from insurance scammers who often stage accidents like this one captured here. Oh my God! Oh my God! That man needs help! Get him to Ensemble Studio Theater, stat! He needs 300 cc's of Actorol. <laughs> I think what we seem to be learning is that Russians, in the course of their everyday lives, see so much crazy <laughs> they have become unfazable. For instance, they've long been accustomed to the fact that your average Russian car can easily be torn apart by your average Russian woman. <laughs> I want the bumper. <laughs> Put cheese on, eat. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, this typical roadside scene, two drivers confront each other with a baseball bat, and yes, that is a hatchet. <laughs> Russia's like a live-action Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> now, if there's a surprising part of this video, it's that those gentlemen arrived at some sort of agreement not to <laughs> bat and hatchet each other to death. See, apparently in Russia, it's very common for your morning commute to involve a hatchet bat dispute or a fighter chopper flyby or a fighter jet flyby or, I don't know, tank! How unfazed are Russians? cows in a mass cow tipping just get up and are like yes folks America may be but not as bad as this So I'm at a real disadvantage having to follow John Stewart here um, and his team that was able to put this stuff together so well. It's a great set of clips, obviously. Um, and I understand why Stewart did what he did, but um, part of his approach was to, to sh show all of this as typical for Russia. Like, oh, you know, the, um, you're going to have a hatchet dispute and the, the um, typical Russian woman can tear apart a car. This typical Russian woman, of course, is not in the most flattering depiction of a typical Russian woman. Um, and um, obviously, as I've said before, if this were typical, it wouldn't be uploaded. Um, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't strike Russians as funny either. Um, but once these things are uploaded, um, as we all know, once these things circulate, they can take on meanings of their own and they're interpreted by whoever interprets them and, um, and all bets are off in terms of original, of original intent. So there are a few tentative um, observations I wanna make here about, um, about all the stuff with the dash cams and the cars and the swearing. Um, I mentioned last week that I'm toying with the idea of thinking about cars as, the, as an extension of the Russian internet itself, which I know is weird. We used the idea of talking about the internet of things, whatever that is, and I'm suggesting it might be an internet of cars. Um, now, all around the world, our domestic and public technologies are gathering countless hours of video and uploading them to the cloud. Um, and this is by definition a connection to the internet, but it doesn't matter if it's not indexed. If no one is going through tagging things and um, marking which of this endless uh, flow of video, which clips are of interest, they may as well not exist um, if you don't have a mechanism for, um, for identifying them. But the dash cam is, um, is particularly spectacular. It, it, um, it gives us great content, though presumably, again, out of hours and hours of stuff that isn't so great. 
Um, but the difference is, of course, that these are in cars that are owned by people who are aware of what's happening and can um, look for the particular timestamp. Um, cars in general with the dash cams end up being kind of like directionless search en engines. They don't know what they're going to find. Um, and, they, um, and only we can determine, we the user, the owner of the car, can determine if it's worth drawing attention to it. Cars also um, display mimetic content themselves, which is the last time because you can put things on cars, signs, and so on and so forth. Um, cars, in a way, are like physical internet bots going out there and, and um, combing the territory. Um, and I want to acknowledge a really uh, good article about um, dash cams by Andrew Chapman in um, Digital Icons from a few years ago. I highly recommend um, taking a look at it. Um, he connects he connects the dash cam with um, the with uh, the man with the movie camera and um, the camera being dislocated from the eye. Um, but this also, as I've said, gives us the question of Russianness for domestic and foreign um, consumption. There is the danger, and I think the Stewart video um, really indulges in, the, indulges in this in a kind of minstrelsy about Russia. There's a huge amount of mimetic content making fun of dumb Russians, but it's making fun of often dumb, lower class, drunk, um, abject Russians collected by Russians who feel superior to them, presumably. Um, Russians are the ones who are tagging it. Russians are the ones who are finding it funny. Russians are the ones who are also perhaps um, framing it as Russian. But we are the ones, the non-Russians who consume it, who see it as, our, um, as some of our primary representations of what Rus life in Russia actually is. Because we don't know about a foreign group. Um, who, if we don't encounter a group of people directly, if they're far away, we know about them from the representations. And so we know, what we know from all of this stream of video, from the dash cams, from the, from the um, video gaming is about wacky, violent, and sometimes strangely blasé Russians. Um, is this just another version of the cheesy 1980s Russian um, Russian American comedian Yakov Smirnov, who was famous for his tagline "What the country?" I'm um, talking about America, who gave us, um, who indirectly gave us the in Soviet Russia meme. Um, and despite the in Soviet Russia meme, and despite the uh, Russianness of um, the dash cam, because it's such, because it's become such a Russian phenomenon, there is a larger um, possible um, thing to be learned about the dash cam here, um, in that it's a model of surveillance that reminds us of how far we are from a classic totalitarian model. It's self-surveillance. It's dis it's a distributed network of surveillance that, that we, uh, that is the car owners, are participating in, and we, the consumers of the video, are validating. Um, it is in that way. It's like so much um, involving the internet. It's like um, the agreements, the, the iPhone user agreements that we sign and we don't really um, understand. We just assent to them. It's like drone footage. Um, so it's, um, it's all invasive. Um, it is surveillance, but it's, um, but it's not necessarily top down. Um, and there's another factor to this in terms of the relationship between the driver and the content that's being gen um, generated here that makes cars special. Um, if, you th if you've driven a car, if you think about what it means to drive a car, when you are first learning to drive a car, it's really, really difficult, and it's hard to think about how the car is functioning in space. And really what's happening as you learn to drive a car and get used to it is um, the phenomenon of proprioception, the notion of where your body is in space, gets extended to the car itself. You're able to drive a car because the car becomes your virtual body. You have a sense, just as you have a sense of where your physical body is in space, you have a sense of where your car body is in space. And that's what makes driving a different car, like going from a small car to a truck, so strange. All of a sudden, your body has gained all of these different dimensions, and you don't know how it moves in space. So cars are an extension of self when you are the driver. Um, and cars now are also a means of surveillance and self-surveillance. Cars, more than anything, I think, um, are what um, make us kind of cyborg beings. Um, because when we are driver, we're part human, part car. And when we're driving a, a um, dash cam enabled car, we're part human, part car, part internet. Um, all the things that we were afraid of when Google Glass was being introduced, of this constant surveillance um, and this uh, weird post Orwellian moment, all of it is already there in the dash cam. So there are two real main arcs here that I'm interested in. Um, that I've already brought up, Russian identity and internet cyborg surveillance. Um, as part of the car, as the car is part of us, we are the camera and we, we turn our fellow humans into viral content and memes. Um, cars and memes all circulate and it's the circulation of them um, in different platforms that makes all of this um, so peculiar. So that's all I want to say about it now and I welcome questions and comments.
All right, I'm going to enable chat for everyone. And go ahead if anybody has any questions. We have a question from, from Elena. You don't need to raise your hand. I can uh, just unmute you. Um, go ahead if you'd like to ask. Well, uh, actually, I did want to ask how, how to raise a hand. Well, because I don't know what icon to use, but you know, as you unmuted me, I have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I was, uh, well, there's something I've been thinking about for, well, quite some time already. And now, you know, here's Elliot with whom I can talk about this. Well, I've done some, um, some research on the internet, some very limited, but uh, I have. So when we do this research, what is it that we are trying to find out? What is our research question? Do we study uh, a particular culture, Russian, Chinese, or whatever, just using a particular medium. Well, you can read Chinese novels or you can look at the Chinese internet and actually you study this Chinese culture. Or are we trying to say something about the medium itself? The way internet is structured, the capacities it provides, etc. So, uh, well, what, what would you say, Elliot? I think it varies. I, th I think both are are valid, and I, and I think, and both of those personally appeal to me. I mean, in the uh, the talks I've done um, so far, the, the ones before today, I think um, d dealt very little with the, the question of what the internet is as a medium, and it was more of a sort of vehicle for for um, thinking about Russia, um, very very tentatively, um, in a very I'd say disorganized way. Um, in the talk today, I'm gesturing in two directions, both of the directions that you in fact talked about, um, studying the culture, but also thinking about um, you know, what the internet is and what the internet does. Um, the, the problem with using one particular culture's um, internet content to talk about what the internet is and what the internet does is um, the whole sample question, which haunts everything, becomes even more important because um, how transferable is this? Ironically, of course, for most people, if we're talking English language stuff, that's never a question because English language is the world. Um, but um, I think in this case, for instance, with, with dash cam video, it's this great sort of sweet spot where um, we can think about the internet in general based on the um, ramifications from this phenomenon, but we have, a, have something that is clearly um, has a very specific um, Russian um, context um, that is interesting to know about. And the Russianness, I expected the Russianness of this context, frankly, to um, exhaust itself much more quickly um, with the spread of dash cams um, around the world. Um, but it really, it really hasn't. Um, because it seems to be an intersection between um, the technology itself and, I guess, the things that are that that the that the camera actually is picking up, um, that pe that cameras in other countries might not be picking up so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, and and for those who are wondering how to to raise your hand, so if you open your participant window in your chat window, there should be options um, right under the list of participants. There should be an option to raise your hand. Um, okay, so we have a question from Andrew. Um, Andrew, I can unmute you. Uh, oh, you've unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Elliot. Um, I came in in the middle of your talk, so I didn't get to hear all of it, but um, I really like the comment about um, us being kind of part person, part internet, um, and you know the boundaries are continually being erased. Um, we're putting out a, um, a retrospective issue of visual icons soon um, in which we've surveyed all of our past participants, you know, for the last 10 years. And, and one of the kind of emerging themes is there's no longer this online offline division. You don't go online anymore because you're, you're always online. Um, you might log out of individual apps and accounts and things like that. But, but basically we're always online these days. Um, increasingly more so being tethered to our, our phones as a sort of satellite of our computer. But um, the other thing is just um, in terms of self-surveillance and, and surveillance, but not being from the top down, 
you know, with the dash cams, of course, you know, people are doing this for, for liability, you know, so that if someone else hits them, they can, they can prove uh, that they're not at fault. Um, they can get lower car insurance rates. Um, and so I, I totally agree with the idea that it's not being imposed on them necessarily, necessarily but there's definitely incentive from the top down to opt in. Um, and then I was just thinking about, you know, since, since writing the dash cam article, you know, they've come out with more things for us to, to tether to our devices. And I was thinking about the ring camera, you know, that attaches to your house. And um, I don't know if you covered that, something like that in the very beginning, but just how would you look at that technology and how it fits into, um, you know, the fact that our cars are filming for us now, our houses are filming for us and, mm -hmm. and how people get caught on camera in those environments. That's an excellent question. And, um, and thank you again for writing that fantastic article that was really um, wonderful. And I recommend that everybody read. Um, so um, yes, the, there, it's not that there's no um, question of authority in terms of why people get the dash cams. I'd see this as an adaptation really to, um, to circumstances that do involve power and do involve governmental structures, but, but more than that. And it's also, um, I think, very typical of a, of a non-totalitarian um, approach to possibly getting people to do something you want them to do, which is not like, let's make a law and have everybody have dash cams, but um, let's keep a situation that incentivizes having dash cams. Now, the house thing is great because um, this gets back to the question of national content and all that. If I think of what I watch on Fail Army, for instance, there's lots of stuff that comes up from these um, house cameras. None of it's from Russia. Um, because where would you, I mean, because maybe people are putting them on their plashadka or somewhere out there, but um, the, the iconography of this is quite obvious, right? The American home and all about the detached home, you know, one story America. Um, so that uh, the forms of, of in, invasion of the um, video technology um, are different depending on the context. And, um, the, and perhaps in America, the context is still the case where the dash cam isn't, isn't quite so necessary. And yes, of course, we all have our phones, which are the most obvious extension of ourselves into the internet. Um, the difference, and this is where Google Glass, I think, comes in, and I mentioned at the end, the difference with the phone is that um, the phone is marked as the phone. The phone is marked as this device that can record you. Um, and um, ironically, we know this from video, because every time we watch a video of some important event, it includes a lot of people holding up their cameras and videotaping it. Um, and they're visibly videotaping it. And with Google Glass, it was in that weird gray area where you're not visibly videotaping it, but you're visibly wearing something that could be video, videotaping you all the time. The car and the home, um, we can be aware that these things are, are videoing you, but these are both places that I think are not thought of initially as sites of recording. Um, so I think they um, end up being assimilated into our consciousness about us being surveilled differently. Now, when it comes to home recording and to buildings and all that, they're, they're, um, we, are, we often are reminded there's a recording specifically to deter us, right? You know, um, this is on, this, this building is being videoed, don't, you know, watch out. Um, but um, I don't think people are, if I'm, I'm not aware of people doing that with their cars and certainly not aware of people doing that with their, with their phones. But always online apps, I mean, my God, look at, what, look at us now. Um, we, are, we are even more always online than we ever were. Um, David, you had your hand raised. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, let me, um, I just un unmuted. I guess you can hear me from yes. on this point, right? Okay, okay. good. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, um, you know, um, about statistics, uh, statistics of um, uh, dash cams um, in Russia and other countries. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, is there some, you know, government uh, agency or, um, I mean, who, 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 if anyone collects, um, collects statistics and what kinds of statistics, uh, statistics about, you know, the, uh, the use of um, the prevalence and the use of, of these um, dash cam uh, dashboard cameras uh, and, um, you know, um, and what kind of statistics and, are, and to what extent are they available? I'm just curious. I haven't seen recent statistics um, because I haven't, I haven't, I will have to look at them when I actually write this up. But um, the source is not government, the source is sales, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sales of dash cams, just like with, this is our standard capitalist approach to, um, to uh, assessing how much of something is circulating. Um, so yeah, sales of dash cams in Russia versus sales of dash cams in America and various European countries. The last I saw, you know, they were going up in America 
Um, and the interesting thing, of course, is, is the question of vulnerability. It, this plays out so differently in America. Um, you know, who in America is most incentivized to have a dash cam? African Americans, um, because they're the ones who are going to, who needs, need protection when they're stopped by, by police. Whereas in, in, in Russia, it's a larger group of people, basically anyone driving a car, um, who feels they need protection um, from, um, from mistreatment. Um, but it's all sales. Um, we have a question from Nick. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a quick question. I was wondering uh, about the law and uh, as was mentioned earlier about Google Glass and more cameras outside. So my concern is from the uh, privacy perspective, how does it influence the other people who are filmed like from the car dashboard camera or the Google Glass or wherever I also like, or like on the cell phone. Mm -hmm. now, do I have any leverage to stop that? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And in fact, um, what the way this works is you are videoed and um, the, the recourse comes when these videos are posted online. So places like Fail Army, for instance, um, given that sometimes I'll watch videos where faces are blurred out, um, I assume from that that they get permission from people to um, show their, uh, their faces on video, otherwise they wouldn't um, blur out some people. So um, I think a lot of it is a matter of um, being told to either um, opt out or opt in. Now, the, now on the in online in general, of course, people can upload whatever they want, and you know this is a huge problem, especially with revenge porn and things like that. Um, that's where the law can come in, usually not very well, because the law is really just not, um, has not developed in any way, um, in any reasonable way to deal with, um, with the internet and privacy. Google Glass is an interesting example where once again we get back to the market. Um, what stopped Google Glass wasn't the law. What stopped Google Glass was consumers um, who were really turned off by the idea that people are out there um, wearing this Google Glass. Um, so it became a marketing disaster, not a legal disaster. It could have become a legal disaster if, if enough people were out there um, filming on Google Glass. Um, but really, it's, I think it's a matter of um, signing a release. Um, do we have any more questions from anyone? Uh, let's get a question from Peter. I'm gonna unmute you, go ahead. He's still mute. He's, he's still mute. Oh, why is this not working? Yep. There we go. Oh yeah, now you're unmuted, Peter. Hi, thanks. Thanks so much. I wanted to ask about parking. I don't think you talked about parking, no. but I remember in 1987-88, the concept of parking didn't exist. You just drove your car up and left it by the side of the road. And then you had the emergence of private guards mm -hmm. who threatened to, to smash your car unless you paid them to protect it and so on. And of course, more recently, there were the disputes, the group, uh, complaining about people illegally parking. So there's a whole uh, subset of the culture around the stationary automobile. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually, I must admit, I don't know much about it. I mean, I, I see uh, clearly the culture of parking has changed drastically. So in the 90s, it was all the, the rakushki, those little, um, like these basically these tin cans that you would, you would um, shells that you would, um, you would have to cover your cars. Um, and those faded quite a bit. Um, and there seems to be, from what I can tell, and there are people on here who would know much better, um, there seem to be parking protocols that are much more um, like the protocols you'd see in, in Europe, you know, where there are places you, know, you, you pay, you get a ticket to put on your car and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I refuse to drive in the former Soviet Union, so I've never, um, the, the idea just absolutely terrifies me, so I've never really learned um, these rules because um, I don't want to subject myself to them. <laughs> I still can't get over the, uh, the whole synchronized swimming people do for left turn when everybody comes to spot and they all turn left to, to make a U-turn at the same time. It's um, amazing to me that there aren't more, more accidents. So I stay clear of all this stuff. Uh, so we have one question from Bambi in the chat. Uh, are men mostly doing the driving and filming and consuming uh, mm. I guess of, of these videos? So um, that's changing a bit. It, it has, so car driving was predominantly a male thing. Um, and in fact, car, car ownership 
certainly in the late Soviet Union and after car ownership, um, not only was it rare and not only was it harder to get a car, um, owning a car, I think to a larger extent than say in America, also entailed knowing how to maintain a car. Um, that is, someone like me can have a car and really know nothing about it and really just try to learn the basics so I don't feel like a total idiot talking to a mechanic and hope that I'm not being completely bilked. Um, but um, my impression always was that if you were if you're not a rich person, if you were a person who owned a car, and usually if you're a man who owned a car, you could do some pretty um, elementary, if, if, if not even more complicated, maintenance on it. Um, now, more and more women have started dri driving cars um, since. I don't know the statistics. I think, I think there's still a predominance of male drivers, but um, I think female drivers are less marked than they used to be. Um, so, but the voices you hear, the voices that you hear in these videos are usually men. We heard, we heard a mix, of course. The, the, um, the swearing voices, actually they can be both, um, but they're, they're uh, often men. Um, I don't know if there's a gender distinction between um, owning dash cams if you own a car, um, but I think there's still probably uh, something of a gender distinction in terms of who is driving and who's owning a car. But I haven't kept up with that. Um, okay. Uh, looks like we have uh, another question from David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Elliot, I wanted to ask about um, um, videos, uh, videos uh, taken well, video, videos of um, this sort of car culture or traffic incidents and arguments taken not from dashboard cameras, but uh, from uh, or with, um, uh, you know, uh, mobile phones uh, mm -hmm. by people who get out of their cars or stay in their cars or by passersby, uh, that sort of phenomenon, um, if you could comment on that. Sure. I mean, and, and in the um, non-Russian videos of these sort of things, they are more likely to be um, camera um, recorded. The, the difference, I, mean, I think one of the ways that dash cams produce better results for these videos is that um, the problem with anything where you're recording something on a camera is it's already started by the time you realize that you should start recording it. That's um, right. mm -hmm. So you've missed something. And the great thing with a dash cam um, is you get it from start to finish. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's like most of the fail videos, for instance, actually with well, a chunk of the fail videos that I see on the internet are of people with their phones watching things. But the thing that's actually still c confounds me when I watch the fail videos is there's just so much, so many videos of people exercising or attempting some tricks and they're just videoing themselves to video themselves. So they're always like recording themselves. And for the life of me, I can't imagine bothering to record, oh, I can't imagine doing most of the things they're doing, but recording myself so much. Um, but what we have now is people who are just in the habit of recording themselves, which gives us more, um, more video. Um, you know, um, if, I, if you don't mind, mind my asking, um, so let's suppose that there is some sort of traffic incident and then there's an argument or a conversation that happens outside the car. Um, do the dashboard, do the dashboard cameras record that? Or I mean, it's through the windshield. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, can you hear, uh, you know, um, conversation happening outside the car or not? The conversation, well, if it's yelling, <laughs> you yeah. can hear it. But what you have is um, what you have is what you often have with sort of randomly collected things. You have what, if it were being deliberately filmed, would be really bad filming um, because everybody keeps um, jumping out of the frame, um, and the the frame of the dash cam is largely the windshield. Um, so um, when it's when it's people arguing and all that, it's when the car is in a good position to catch it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think so. Presume like if you if you have two people fighting on the street. Um, and the street has a bunch of cars and presumably there are a lot of cars that are have the dash cams operating but there are only a couple of them that have a good view and those are the ones right. that are able to um, upload stuff. And so does the dashboard camera, uh, how, how well does it record sound uh, taking place outside the car? It's not great, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it records sound getting up to the car. I mean, I think the important thing about it is that it records the sound of someone, of a cop standing um, outside your window talking to you. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we'll take one last question from Zena. You've been waiting for a while. I can unmute you now. Yeah, hi. I'm just uh, curious about what explains the popularity of all these dash cams from uh, videos from Russia and just of uh, other videos, again, from Russia that 
I, I get a lot of them from my friends. They just send them to me, but I don't really see much on the internet from other countries. Do they just not record anything? Does nothing happen like this? Or is it just because there's so much of it that comes from Russia and that's why you know, it becomes so popular and viral? Well, that, that is the question that is basically haunting my entire um, research into all this stuff because, um, because, because yeah, there, what, as I said in the beginning, there is this stereotype of Russia as this place where all of these strange things happen. And, you, and um, the source of these incredible encounters and the incredible um, behaviors and often involving drunkenness or fighting or so on and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, the dash cam um, explains some of it, but... Um, there could be a selection bias, but it seems so. Part of it is is a kind of market, right? Once you know, once people have identified um, Russia as a place that gives you wacky video content, that then presumably produces a um, desire for more of it, right? And also the the recognition of the phenomenon of um, wacky Russian video content. So it, it becomes kind of self-perpetuating. But it does seem to be that Russia is um, producing, um, seems to be producing a lot more of it. Now, the Meanwhile in Russia meme, what's interesting there is I haven't tracked down what started first. I think Meanwhile in Russia started first, but there's, there's Meanwhile in Japan, there's Meanwhile in a whole bunch of countries. Um, but from what I can tell, um, and again, I, I, I looked at the Meanwhile Russian, in Russia a few years ago, and I need to, to refresh my, my research on it, but the meme, I think. I mean, um, from what I could tell, Meanwhile in Russia just had a greater impact than, say, Meanwhile in Japan or Meanwhile in China, um, for instance. And, mean, you know, you would think Meanwhile in China could work, too, because, of, you know, a huge country with um, similar um, range of um, economic... Uh, range of economic opportunities and economic backgrounds and, and um, clashes of city and country and all of this stuff. Um, but meanwhile in China, from what I can tell, has not taken off anything like, uh, like meanwhile in Russia. Um, and then also, um, this is something that, that I can find very hard to, to prove or demonstrate. It feels correct to me. And again, this is like, I can say it aloud, but I'm not sure I could ever write it, um, is that this becomes a kind of point of pride um, that um, the that it's Russians are producing the wacky video and kind of getting into the wacky video and ha ah, yeah here we are um, um, aren't we aren't we funny aren't we crazy um, and in a way that fits in I mean it's sort of like the the um, the zapoy the drunkenness scene from um, from Barber of Siberia um, where you have this stereotypical this stereotypical display of Russian excess that presumably could be offensive if a non-Russian um, were the one producing it but that um, Russian audiences are recognizing and enjoying. Um, so that could be part of it as well. I really don't want to be an the answer to be something so um, so primitive and problematic as Russia is just stranger than other countries, or people behave worse in Russia than other countries. That strikes me as wrong for for a whole variety of reasons. But um, Russia seems to be producing a lot more of this stuff than other countries. Yeah, I know that makes sense, especially that the kind of the strange pride thing. I think that makes sense based on what I know about like us Russians. So it's <laughs> like, it, it does make sense, yeah. But uh, there's yeah. no one to cite for that, unfortunately. All right, I think, uh, wanna thank everyone again. Thanks so, much for, thanks so much for joining us and hopefully we'll see many of you back here next Friday. Thank you. Oh, thanks everyone.